people, welcome. And how are you doing? doing? Good. Very well. How are you doing? Um, so far, okay. Uh, better than uh, last week. So uh, I guess um, let's just remind ourselves of um, some timing. So uh, this weekend is the deadline for the full credit for the first problem set. Thank you. The several thousand of you already uh, turned in your answers, and uh, please, all the rest, try to do it by the end of the weekend. Um, it, it's a good idea to turn in problem set two also, just to keep pace with everything. But uh, in addition to that, um, we will have the beginning of the next week uh, starting on Sunday uh, midnight, and that means you get um, you get a, a new um, a new set of lectures, new uh, uh, weekly quiz, and problem set three will all be available uh, by first thing on Monday. So. Um, those are the main logistics. Uh, there are several oh, sort of uh, tech support kind of things that, that ca came up. The one thing I will mention is that apparently it's a, it's a, a, it's a real issue that when you're an the, the buttons to answer the, um, uh, the, the, the question and the problem sets are very sensitive. And so that if you're anywhere on that line of the page and you click, uh, you will be clicking the button at that level. And so uh, it really should be ch uh, fixed, and we're asking the people to do that. But in the meanwhile, just be careful. After you've answered your question, just use the scroll bar to look at all your, um, uh, at all your answers, make sure you're, you're the, the one you intended, and then submit. Okay. So those are the main logistics yeah. I had in mind. Yeah, um, so what should we speak about now? Well, let's, uh, we can talk about some of the, so there's some issues that have been popping up in the forums that uh, are, are there enough that we might speak generally about them. Sure. Do you want to, do you want to start with the, with the game lab maybe? Um, sure. Okay. We can, so people have been curious about some of the other games and how the, some of the data came out. Um, and actually, we have a picture on the... Uh, we do, but uh, hold on one second. Yeah. Uh, Adrian, I need to control here. So you need to stop what you're doing. So I can... Uh, I'm going to invite. And I need to screen share here. Yeah. So, so people have asked beyond the first game, uh, beyond the, the guessing two-thirds of the mean game, what... what uh, some of the outcomes of the of the play were, and and here is a a graph of. Uh, is this what you want? No, this one is the the data from the game lab. Okay. Um. So this is the uh, just a breakdown of of the play in the Prisoner's Dilemma game that we asked people to play, and it's sort of interesting. So it's a one shot Prisoner's Dilemma, which, as we know in terms of the theory, we would have a strictly dominant strategy. So people would want to, in this case, testify would be the prediction of eliminating strictly dominated strategies. Uh, you can see on the, the screen there in terms of what people actually did, um, overall people testified less than half the time. Uh, you know, we broke it bond down by gender. It's not that much different. Uh, I guess males testified slightly more than females. Um, you see some differences across countries. Uh, and, you know, one thing that's sort of interesting about this is Certainly when, you, when we're playing games, uh, the context makes people think of different things and uh, whether or not people are reacting to the payoffs that are on within the problem or whether they have something else in mind is, is an interesting thing. So just as a check of this, uh, I, I used my, my day class here at, at Stanford as uh, some guinea pigs to try the same exact problem but without the terminology. So they didn't have the terminology of testify and remain silent. They just had A and B, and they didn't know how it affected the other agents. And then uh, basically 100% of them picked um, the testify uh, answer, which would be what, you would, what the game theory would predict if you didn't have the labels and, and other thoughts in your mind when you're answering this question. So I guess this says something about you know, making sure that we have exactly what people's payoffs are in mind when, when they're thinking of the question, it's not clear 
uh, how people are going to react to things if they have uh, other things in mind than, than what the, the modeler has in mind. Yeah, and we speak a lot about framing effects, right? Yes. So the way you frame the issue can impact the on the raw mathematics. Yes, that's so a very, this very, is interesting. A very good example of that. Since we're looking at this, and I flashed this on, do you want to speak about uh, this? Or? Sure, we can talk about this a little bit while we have the screen here. So another question that people have been asking is, is in the tragedy, the commons games, you know, so, some of the issues of, for instance, why is it that it turns out that the optimal solution is, is uh, 500 compared to the uh, maximum 1,000 that they see in the problem? And so this graph just plots out the A here is the total catch of the society, uh, or sorry, total effort of the society in terms of, of hours spent. And then if you write down that function, uh, you can plot it out. And it's just a simple quadratic function. And you begin to see that it has a very nice shape to it. And, and uh, if the society is, is spending uh, the right amount of time in terms of effort, so the, the 500, um, then you hit this maximum of 250,000, and basically they're fishing at an amount that's a lot that allows the the stock to replenish itself at a rate that's fast enough so that uh, they get a you know a healthy amount. And the, the difficulty with the Nash equilibrium is people tend to overfish because each individual doesn't take into account the negative impact that they're having on the society. So you end up much further to the right on that curve, and it drives down the the total catch of the society. Okay. So um, um, maybe some other issues, uh, and then we'll uh, uh, open it up to some discussions. Um, I see several people are logged in, and somehow I don't see their image. Uh, I don't see Alvaro. I don't see Jim. I don't see Roar. Oh, you see Roar now. Oh, I do, upside yeah. down, but I do. Um, um, so maybe before we uh, take some live questions, the minimax. sorry, the minimax. Yeah. Um, so um, one set of issues that have come up have to do with uh, minimax versus Nash equilibrium. And maybe the most concrete uh, version of it is: Look, uh, you gave us two ways to compute the value of a zero-sum game. Uh, one or uh, one is the 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 general procedure for two by two two player games uh, that uh, uh, that was fairly simple, and then in the special case of zero sum games, you set it up as a as a linear program and showed us we could solve it that way. But it's much more complicated. So why go to the trouble if uh, we have a much simpler procedure? Um, so it's a fair question, uh, but it's also an opportunity to kind of drill down on some of the issues and remind ourselves. So first of all, uh, remember that uh, zero-sum games are, are very special. And, um, and um, have special properties. So in particular, um, finding the minimax uh, value of the game uh, by the way, zero sum or not is a relatively easy problem, easy in the computational uh, sense. Um, that is, um, uh, in computer science, and, and many of you are, but not all of you are computer scientists, we speak about the computational complexity of problems, uh, which means as we scale the problem to be larger and larger, how hard does it become uh, to solve the problem? And it turns out that uh, whereas so in the two simple two-player, two-by-two games, finding both the mixed strategy national equilibrium and, and the, uh, the, the uh, minimax uh, strategies uh, is easy. As we scale it to larger and larger games, the uh, minimax uh, strategy remains relatively easy to solve, by which we mean there's a polynomial, essentially, a polynomial time solution, solution that is whose running time is polynomial in the size of the problem. So it, it goes up, but not that dramatically. Whereas finding a, a, even a single Nash equilibrium of a game uh, is a very hard problem. In fact, it's a fascinating question. And how hard it is is something that only recently 
we've gotten to understand uh, there's a class called PPAD, and this is among the hardest problems in that class. But without going into details, let me just say that it seems like a very hard problem for which no polynomial time solutions will exist, certainly harder than the uh, minimax uh, strategy. And so it's worthwhile understanding the uh, linear program, even though in the 2 by 2 uh, case, uh, it seems more difficult than uh, the, uh, the, the alternative. Well, if you're coming on, please mute your microphone so it doesn't uh, pick up the one, one thing to say more generally is that uh, you know th there sometimes games have a lot of structure to them and makes finding equilibria intuitive and easy, um, and other times they don't. And and then something like using a, a Minimax program can give us insights that we wouldn't be able to find directly by by sort of intuitive reasoning about the game and the structure. So so if a game has a lot of monotonic structure to it. Uh, something like centipedes and so forth, there's a structure that we begin to see what kind of iterative reasoning we can use and, and we can solve it logically. Whereas games with, that are much more complicated, uh, sometimes we have to do more brute force, uh, use more brute force, and, and then something like Minimax is a very powerful tool that can give us insights that we couldn't see just by our own reasoning. Right. Um, again, a, a potentially long discussion about computational methods in game theory, but it's true that uh, minimax kind of bounds the, the bounds what what you can expect for in an equilibrium and you know, the various methods, some of them complete but uh, exponential time in the worst case, and some of them heuristic and incomplete, but in practice and, and, uh, faster and uh, yeah, it's an interesting discussion. Um, it does also raise the related question of, so what should you care about? The uh, minimax value of the game or the natural equilibrium of the game? Right. Um, and uh, that also is a, is a yeah. complicated uh, issue, isn't it? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, do we have any pat answer? No, not a pat answer, but I guess, you know, as we've seen in some of the games, it's, it's sometimes unpredictable what other people are going to do in a game. And if you don't really have a good prediction, Minimax tells you this is at least what I can guarantee, you know, what, what, what my safe level of play is. And uh, sometimes knowing that is a, is a worthwhile thing if you can't make predictions about what somebody else is going to do. It is a fairly um, uh, conservative approach to the problem. Uh, yeah. Some might say paranoid. I think you need to mute your microphone because you're being picked up. Uh, Romel. Yeah. You're the Ro culprit, Romel. Your, your microphone needs to be muted, so otherwise sorry, you'll, sorry. Yeah, you'll be picked up and then... Good. Not that we don't want to hear you, but in just one moment. Good. You're muted. Um, right. So, but maybe uh, this is a good time to... Uh, Take some questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyone... Uh, Robert, do you want to say something? Uh, not that Is anybody time. hearing? Yeah, you just said. Do you have a question that you wanted to ask or no? Uh, hello, hello. Hello? Adrian, can you hear? Yes, I can hear him. He's speaking. Okay. Did, did you want to uh, ask a question? Hello? Okay, you want let's to pick somebody else? Yeah, yeah let's try somebody else. Uh, anybody who wants to speak, uh, please raise your hand and we'll call on you. It would be the easiest way to do it. Um, so, Jim, go ahead. Unmute your mic and ask your question. I cannot. Hold on one second. Uh, we can't. Hear? Yeah, let's just start speaking again, please. We can't hear you yet. Jim? Hold on a second. Adrian, could you hear him? He's muting his, unmuting his mic right now. Do you want to speak, Jim? We, we can't hear you. Jim Chi, can you speak now? He is speaking, but we, we, we see your mouth move, but we're not hearing it. Your microphone is not unmuted. Let's, let, let's see if the problem is at our end. So no, it was, it was on and it, was up. it went on and off. So. Hello? Hello? There he is. Okay. Hello? Okay, he's working now. 
Okay, do you want to ask I, your question? Yes, yes. Um, I want to ask a question about uh, the dominant, uh, dominant strategy and, um, and, and the Nash equilibrium. Um, um, so, uh, in my understanding, um, every na uh, dominant strategy sh uh, should be a Nash equilibrium. Um, but I just got it, uh, got a bit confused in the case when uh, when there is a weekly dominant strategy. Um, so, so there there may be not uh, there, there may be more than one Nash equilibrium in this case. So, am, am I right here? Uh, yes, indeed. There, there can be multiple Nash equilibria, and uh, in, in fact, uh, when you have combinations of dominant strategies, then they will be Nash equilibria. But there can be Nash equilibria where people play dominated strategies, um, even in a game where there are exist dominant strategies. So not all games have dominant strategies, in which case Nash equilibrium becomes a reasonable prediction. Um, but in settings where there uh, where there are dominant strategies, those will be combinations of those will form Nash equilibria, but there could also be others. So, so in a case uh, with a, a weekly, uh, weekly, uh, there's a weekly dominant strategy. Um, then, how can I find uh, the other Nash equilibrium except for the for the dominant uh, dominant strategy? You should go ahead because I could hear just oh, okay. I have a problem with my. Oh, uh, Joe is having a problem with the, the earphone there. So the the question here was uh, whether in in a game where there are dominant strategies and then we know they form a Nash equilibria, there might be other Nash equilibria. How do we find them? Unfortunately, there's not easy methods for finding all Nash equilibria of games. So if it's mm -hmm. a simple game, we just check uh, one by one. Um, to see which strategies uh, form a Nash equilibria. And we might have to check for, for mixed strategies and so forth, and there can exist other ones. And there's no easy answer to that question because there's, there's, not, a, there's not a good algorithm for finding all Nash equilibria of a game. As we mentioned just uh, slightly uh, a few minutes ago, it's, it's a hard problem. Right. Uh, let me just, uh, by the way, I, I'm having um, the strange situation where I need to press a button in order to hear anybody speak. So hopefully uh, I'll be able to without explaining my strange posture. Uh, so to quickly add to uh, Matt's answer, um, if you fix the support of the strategy, no, I'll, I'll be okay. Yeah. If you fix the support of the strategy, then you can set up a linear program that will efficiently find a Nash equilibrium with that support if it exists. The support means all the strategies that are played with non-zero probability in the mixed strategy, uh, all the, the, the pure stra uh, actions. Uh, but unfortunately, there's an exponential number of combinations of, of, of supports you might have to try. So again, the answer is, in, in general, unfortunately, it's hard. So thank you for that. Let's uh, move to somebody else. Um, and uh, please mute your mic and somebody else raise your hand and uh, speak up. Um, somebody, right here. Alexis. Alexis, did you try to say? Okay, go ahead. Uh, unmute and speak. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you well. Where are you from? Well, hmm. uh, I'm from Puerto Rico. I live now in the Seattle area. Um, okay. but I, and I'm really enjoying the class. Thank you for this. Uh, so I have a question regarding the game theory lab, specifically the buying a gold mine. In that one, I had I had no idea. I still have no idea how to make it into some form that I can digest and analyze it. Uh, I was thinking of the metric. I was thinking maybe some equations somehow. Um, just wanted to to see if you can if you can provide some strategies of how to attack a problem like this. Go ahead. Sure. Okay. So, so this is a question about you know uh, the the gold mine question is a Bayesian game and that's a game we'll uh, cover in a in a, a couple of lectures from now. Um, so we haven't actually gone through some of the detail explicitly, but it's conceptually we can talk about equilibrium the same way that we do before, where people's strategies are uh, best responses to what other people are doing. The, the complication now is going to be that each person gets different information in the game, and so we'll have to have a way of mapping what you see in the game, what signal did you get about how much gold there was in the gold mine, 
into what you do. And so then you have to forecast what are other people doing as a function of what signals they might see. What are the possible signals they might see, and, and what's my best response to, to how other people are acting? So visualizing it in terms of a matrix, it's going to be a big matrix now. So especially with lots of bidders and lots of signals. So instead, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about just having a function which tells you how to bid as a function of your signal, and then looking for, for equilibrium where everybody's doing the best that they can in each possible scenario, given what they anticipate others doing. So that'll be coming up in some of the lectures. OK, thank you. Um, Alexis, please mute your mic. Alvaro or uh, Olivier or Roar or uh, Robert, any of you want to chime in? Speak now or forever all your time. Yeah, Roar. Yeah. I think that's Roar. Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, Unmute and yes. speak. Yes, you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. I sent you an email where I did ask for practical uh, examples on how to use uh, um, theory. And I also uh, made an example from Poland where we are using a uh, Bayesian game in order to um, more make a method of of uh, method of making a traffic analysis of a network. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll do a deal with you. We'll answer your question. If you do two things, tell us how to pronounce your name correctly, and tell us where you're from. Uh, my name, that's uh, my first name, that's Edward, and I'm, I'm from Norway. Ah, okay. okay great. Um, so, um, w in fact, we've gotten several questions about the practical applications of game theory, and I think we'll give uh, initial answers now, and I'm sure that this issue will come back again, and um, and I think we'll devote the last meeting of the class to uh, speak uh, kind of leisurely about this topic. But let me maybe take a quick stab at it and sure. look at it. So um, there are many, many areas that have reached out to game theory for help. Um, economics um, is perhaps a preeminent one, and um, Matt here can speak to that uh, in, in just a moment. But uh, I can tell you that in, um, in uh, online ad auctions uh, on Google um, and other companies, um, game theory plays a key role in trying to design the auction in a way that's revenue maximizing, efficient, intuitive, and so on. So in general, in, in, in electronic commerce, uh, game theory plays a, 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 a critical role. Uh, there's a, a, a conference uh, called the uh, ACM, uh, which is the uh, uh, Association for Computing Machinery, uh, a conference called EC for Electronic Commerce, and the papers are primarily game theoretic. Um, the, from, taken from a very different perspective, um, you might ask, so how about in gaming? Um, just uh, whether it's poker or chess or what have you, uh, does game theory play play a role? And and here the answer is I would have to say uh, mixed. Certainly in the early days of, of chess, for example, uh, the Minimax and the Minimax procedure, which is based on the Minimax theorem, played a key role uh, in designing the first chess playing programs. If you look today at the competitions that take place, uh, from robotic soccer to a trading agent competition to robotic pool playing, and then kind of, you know, the snooker, not the wet games. Uh, I would have to say, in most of them so far, game theory has not played a key role. But there's one huge exception: that's wow. poker. Until recently, uh, poker played. Uh, poker players were. Uh, uh, that is, games playing poker 
uh, we're really very bad when uh, playing against humans. Uh, by the way, um, Olivier, uh, your mic is not muted. If you don't mind, mute it. Okay. okay. I'm not sure how to actually hear. Okay. okay. Then if you don't know how to do it, then just be very, very silent. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, the, um, uh, so Poke, as I was saying, until recently, um, uh, uh, programs were very bad. And then they got very good. And how did they good? We get good by essentially completing the natural equilibrium of the game. Now, it's not exactly right. So they actually computed an approximate equilibrium of an abstract version of the game. And that's, um, that, that's actually a very fascinating topic. But the, at, at the core, they did reach out to game theory to play poker well. So here are two examples of electronic commerce where game theory uh, plays a very important role. Game playing where it plays a role sometimes, not others. And um, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a mixed uh, record. Matt, do you want to add to this? Uh, sure. So, so as you have mentioned, it's, a, it's made a huge strides, or, or it's one of the main tools used in economics. And just as an example, for instance, uh, when the Federal Trade Commission is trying to understand whether it should allow a merger between two companies, they have to forecast what's going to happen in a, in a new market now where you have two companies that have merged and you have a different number of players and they have uh, different uh, strengths. Um, how is that going to impact prices? How is that going to impact consumer welfare? So these kinds of forecasts are often made using game theoretic models now. And th th those would be the bread and butter of the uh, of, of the uh, toolkit that they would have available. And and I think now, you know, as, as we'll see in the course, there's sort of two aspects to game theory. One is that it frames questions very clearly, so that we know exactly what we're talking about. And the other is that it makes predictions. And I think that it's important on both sides. And so one part is just making sure we can frame questions really clearly. And the other is that it makes predictions. And sometimes the predictions aren't as valuable as we might like, but we get intuitions and we get uh, you know, ideas of how to, how to proceed from, from the analysis. But the framing of the question is just as important. OK, thank you, Norway. Um, quickly, does Alvaro or uh, Olivier. Olivier or Pablo or Robert any of you want to chime in? Question. I, I, if you do, some of you yeah, are yeah, not yeah. visible. Yeah, so visible so unmute okay. and speak. So go ahead. Uh, I have a specific question about an issue that can come up in uh, backward induction. If I'm at the uh, final note, say it's a centipede game, and I'm at the final node and it's two that's acting and say he's indifferent to what he does but say the payoffs to one are a minus b and a plus b and if I go back to the so okay two is indifferent now I go back to one and now his payoff is a and I don't know what decision he's supposed to make at that point because it's going to depend upon whether 2 goes with A plus B or A minus B in the, in the final terminal. And I, if I try and calculate a uh, perfect subgame from, from that point, I see there's two Nash equilibria there, but I'm, I'm still stuck on, on what to do. It's okay. Why do you take it? Because I missed the, okay, the, okay. the beginning. So, so uh, what, you know, the, the, this general question of using backward induction to find subgame perfect equilibria, uh, as you're pointing out, there can exist multiple possible solutions in a subgame when, when one of the players is indifferent. And in fact, what you can do is, is for each possible choice of that player, then you can go backwards and that will give you a valid solution. So if you pick one of the ones that they're okay. indifferent between, that'll give you a solution. And, and the answer is that, that each one of those turns out then to be a subgame perfect equilibrium. When you do backward induction and you pick any choice, including a mixed strategy. So you could have the last player mix, and then that would give expected payoffs in that subgame. Yeah, and you can back, backward induct. 
Yes, I, 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 can, I, can, I can certainly see where the mixed strategy uh, would work, but what I guess where the confusion came in for me is the, uh, the temporal aspects of the game, because if, in fact, one has to act before two does, then uh, right. it's, yeah, it's, I mean, not, it's, it's not so clear that, uh, to me, what the solution is in terms of pure strategies. Right, and, 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 and indeed, I think, you know, the, as you're mentioning the temporal aspect of these games, the backward induction solution is, is one where people have forecasts of what they think is going to happen in the game, and then they use those to choose their earlier strategies. And indeed, one player has to make a choice just guessing or anticipating what the other player is going to do. And in this kind of case, if it's not forecastable, they're going to have to have beliefs about that, and those are going to shape what, what right. happens earlier in the game. And the, the answer is that different people might have might come to different conclusions, and then each one of those possible subgame perfect equilibria could be rational in some sense and and a fully coherent way to play the game in in different people's minds, and might end up with very different outcomes. So uh, the multiplicity is is a fact of life, and and all of these forecasts that people make aren't necessarily always unique, and that can cause us headaches. Robert, where are you from? I am from uh, the U.S., okay. Southern, Southern California. All right. Enjoy the weather. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, anybody else want to chime in before we conclude the session? Now's your time. Just speak up. It seems like uh, the, the question about practical application of game theory, uh, I was thinking of it when I was... Uh, browsing TV the other day is uh, storage wars. <laughs> it seems very similar to the uh, gold mine uh, game where they look at something, they put some value, and then they have to, uh, based on the value, they have to decide whether or not <coughs> how much they want to pay for, for the storage. So. Yeah, exactly. That's, a, that's a, a very good example of an auction, essentially, uh, with unknown value and, and people who might be experts or might not be uh, bidding uh, for, for it. So, indeed. Alvaro, Olivier, um, um, yeah, I don't have a question. Hi, can, can I ask a question? Who is it? You can, whoever you are. Yeah, uh, I'm Jim. It's Jim here. Thank my, Jim. for some reason, my cam camera just stopped working, and then okay. I, I don't see myself here. Um, well, just well, we okay. actually see you fine. Yeah. Um, just following uh, my previous question, uh, I, I just want to clarify it uh, again. And uh, in, in the case, because uh, in the case where there's um, there's a weekly dominant strategy, um, the intuition is that uh, if there is a dominant strategy, everyone should act um, act like uh, while the dominant strategy, even though it is weekly dominant. Because you can never be worse if you act, um, if you if you do the dom uh, wicked dominant strategy. Um, so the intuition is that if everyone acts according to the uh, uh, wicked dominant strategy, then there should be only one Nash equilibrium. So I just got it. I, I'm just still quite a bit confused that why um, in a, in this case there would be more than one Nash equilibrium. It, it seems like anti uh, uh, like counter intuitive to me. Uh. Going. Okay, so so you know, I think that the answer to that is is that uh, it, Nash equilibrium doesn't use dominance arguments, and there's separate kinds of reasoning. And and indeed, part of the reason that we have multiple uh, types of solution concepts is that that there's different ways to reason through how people might act in the game. And I think that your strong intuition is: look, if you've got a dominant strategy then any other prediction in the game seems to be not so reasonable. And indeed, that's one argument against Nash equilibrium. So Nash equilibrium isn't the, the end-all answer to everything in saying that every one could be played. People, game theorists argue sometimes that certain Nash equilibria are more reasonable predictions than other ones. And as you're pointing out, if people have dominant strategies, then it might be a more reasonable prediction to say that that's mm -hmm. the equilibrium we expect to see than one where people use dominated strategies. And, uh, you know, experimentally we do tend to see if people have weakly dominant strategies and they're experienced players, and experience makes a big difference in this, um, then you might, 
you, you're more likely to see that. But in, in experienced players, it's you know anything's possible, and uh, so it's still a useful concept more generally. But you're right; it, it, some Nash equilibria are more reasonable than others, and so I don't think there's you know the confusion isn't so much that that there's uh, a conflict between these; they're just giving you different answers, and, and hmm. we have to put both of those together to get a reasonable view of the world. I see. I think maybe we'll uh, wind down. Uh, hello. Sure. Uh, two. Uh, uh, so two final comments. Uh, one is uh, we will uh, look into changing the time of the weekly screen try chat, realizing that no no time would be good for everybody around the world, but uh, perhaps Friday morning California time inconveniences more people than some of the time. So. Look out uh, for the announcement about the, the next time. And the last thing is, um, I've now gotten the third question about the painting behind us. <laughs> this is a painting on the uh, Stanford Hills behind the campus. The painter is a good friend of mine by the name of Jo Dean, J-O, she's a lady. And uh, she's a very... Uh, unassuming, uh, modest person, and if somebody sent nice uh, topics, uh, nice comments, uh, then I'm sure she'd appreciate it uh, very much. So thank you all very much, and we'll see you next week. Thank you. Take care.